Uh, Leon Hurst, who is the head of product marketing for Connected Car at Jaguar Land Rover. Uh, so, Leon, if, I hope by the fact that you're standing up, you're, you're Leon. Um, I will hand over to you. Hello, can everyone hear me? Very good. Okay, thank you, Matt. Clicker in hand. I've been wired up because I'm a little bit of a wanderer, so I'm sorry if you yeah, see me going. No, 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 you're okay if you don't mind me moving. So um, thank you for that, Matt. Um, I've come here today to share a little bit of experiences from the other side of the fence. So I'm a vertical. So I create solutions and I sell those uh, essentially to my customers who go and buy my vehicles. Um, I head up uh, product marketing for a connected car, and so that means that I have a responsibility for the product definition around all of our connected car products, um, the infotainment systems that come uh, within our cars, uh, the marketing of those, and all of the commercialization that go around that. Now, Matt made a distinction between M2M and IoT, and in that case, I'm actually not entirely sure exactly where I fall. I don't know whether I'm an M2Mer or whether I'm an IoTer. I am sure, however, that on a weekly basis, me and my team are developing new business models and new opportunities that are going at such a pace that we're not almost sure how to keep up with these new opportunities. And uh, as we'll see, uh, a lot is driven by the data opportunity that the vehicle brings us. So let's kick off. So Jaguar Land Rover, um, an interesting success story of recent times. Um, the growth in Jaguar Land Rover from a connected car perspective actually brings people who work in, uh, in an IoT space some interesting challenges. Um, two brands, two customer sets, two divergent sets of requirements sometimes. Um, twelve vehicle lines, so almost twelve sub-brands. A Defender customer who's taking his truck effectively around the hills in Devonshire is wanting something quite different from his vehicle than a Range Rover customer in London, and what are the products and services that they're looking for? What are their needs? Quite different. 172 countries we sell our cars in. And alone, that's not necessarily a surprising thing, but the fact that our sales are geographically spread so evenly presents actually quite an interesting challenge. So a fifth of our sales effectively go to the US, to the UK, to Europe, to China, and then a fifth to the rest of the world. So you can imagine that entering into uh, communications negotiations with global mobile network operators is quite an interesting challenge when we want to provide global services. And it's also a company which has committed to 40 major new product actions in the next five years. So not only are we doing this now, but it's all planned to go and grow much faster and accelerate. So for our community within the company who are building these connected car products, those statistics have been guaranteed to grow faster we will have more vehicle lines, we will have more volume, and we will actually have more countries, if one can imagine it. So, it starts with customer-focused products, and um, in actual fact, we've spent a lot of time actually earlier looking at some uh, products which were a little bit customer-focused, and we will talk about some B2B and B2B2C products. But in Jaguar Land Rover, uh, we started our connected car journey looking very much at uh, customer-focused products um, for the very simple reason that Jaguar Land Rover is a very customer-focused company. We build 
product that we sell to customers. Um, and it turns out that um, building a connected car solution is fairly capital intensive for us. Uh, and in order to get a return on investment that would get approved by the board, uh, we needed to be able to show a fairly concise business case. And where would you be able to create such a business case with a predictable return on investment, but with a customer-driven product, which the company knows how to deliver to market? So our first set of products uh, come under the uh, identity of in control. And uh, we have a, an entire suite of products uh, starting, I'll, I'll kind of walk a little bit through some of these. We have emergency call, so uh, Matt referred to legislation coming in. It's not just Europe, it's also in Russia coming in where we'll have to provide emergency call. In Brazil, there's regulatory requirements coming in for stolen vehicle tracking hardware to come into vehicles. Um, very good cases for those. We have, um, we also have uh, a connected app, which I'm actually going to take the very risky move of showing you a prototype connected to a prototype vehicle. So if my development team back home Can we switch over to the, uh, there we go. So, <coughs> this is me connected to uh, one of my test users back home. And we can see this is a, a test Jaguar XJ. He's just refueled it this morning actually. He was down to 22 miles of range, which was quite tricky. Um, this is a test vehicle, so at the very bottom you can see that we don't treat our test vehicles very well. There's uh, lots of things going wrong, tire pressure, for example, that we haven't, uh, whoops, that we haven't dealt with yet. Um, there we go. You can see we're down here, the blue dot in London, and the, the vehicle is actually based up in Gaydon uh, in Warwickshire. Uh, it's currently unlocked. If I press that button there, we can see that uh, it's, the alarm is not set, but the vehicle, most of the accesses to the vehicle are shut. Matt referred to starting his car this morning and warming it up. I tell you, once you get this feature in your hand, and uh, it was minus five in Gaydon this morning, I was able to check the car. This big round button here, from the warmth of your home with your Frosties in front of you, is the button you want to press. You can time it if you want. You can change the target temperature as well. Um, you get a log of your journeys. So. Here we see a journey from yesterday. So this is the test engineer who's actually driven it back to their home. We obviously encourage our, our engineers to be using the vehicles as much as possible during the test cycles. Oops. Yeah, we have Wi-Fi problems here. We, um, we have means of getting in touch with the assistants. So there are two types of key assistance. There's the breakdown assistance and the stolen vehicle tracking assistance. And then here, in actual fact, we support our customers to have multiple vehicles. At the moment, I'm only registered with one vehicle with this particular app, but uh, in actual fact, we can have multiple vehicles. So, thank you. <laughs> can we go back to the slides? So, so that little app actually will turn out to be extremely important as we go forward because that little app is uh, an entire window forward to our customers. Um, 
the functionality that we get with that app is we create a direct relationship with our customers. The customers can uh, go forth and uh, interact with the vehicle. They get a great sense of convenience out of that. Cold mornings, in actual fact, um, when we sell into our 172 countries, as we go into Saudi Arabia and UAE, for example, the problem is not the cold, the problem is the heat. And we have got customers who go to the cinema, park in the underground parking, and will leave the car turned on with the aircon on for the two and a half hours of a movie in order to get back out into a cool vehicle. Now, that's not ecologically you know, the best thing to do, um, but this kind of feature would certainly make it much better so that you could just time it so that uh, you wouldn't have to do that. We also have uh, products which are, one key product is stolen vehicle tracking. So um, a product which essentially when the vehicle is stolen, uh, the vehicle notices it, it informs a call center, which is a secure call center, knows how to deal with it. Customer gets called to inform them, sir, I believe your vehicle has been stolen, can you confirm this? On confirmation and with a, a police reference number, the customer is then taken out of the loop. And it is the call center that deals with the local authorities to help to locate and recover the vehicle. And the provision of a stolen vehicle tracking service is an entirely different thing in, in a country like UK or, or in Germany than in certain other countries like, for example, in Russia or in China. So this is one set of, of uh, connected products. And this is built very much around a, a telematics. I don't know it's, if it's an M2M platform or an IoT platform. We should have a chat about that. <laughs> Um, but there is a, a telematics box in the vehicle, and then there is an off-car platform which does a data aggregation, there's a data gateway, uh, there's an entire architecture of uh, plugins into a whole network of call centers uh, as well as a, a middleware of services. Now, we can skip past that because the demo worked. A second part of our product suite is very much focused around our customers because no matter what we as Jaguar Land Rover curate as a set of in-car experiences, um, we can never really deal with the breadth of um, differences between our different customer sets, especially when we go into different geographies. So we must cater for our customers bringing in their own applications, their own experiences, their own preferences. So we have especially got two key products. So we have a, a product called In Control Apps. Not surprisingly, it takes your mobile phone, you plug it in, and then applications that you have on your phone get uh, mounted up onto the display. That's a safe location from which to manipulate your application. And it's not just mounting the product up onto the display, but in actual fact, there is also some data driven up from the vehicle that becomes available to the application as well. So hence, it becomes an IoT node. And a second product that completes the customer experience is uh, a Wi-Fi hotspot. It's true to say that uh, in tablets, about 5% of tablets that are sold today are actually uh, containing a SIM card that's connected. So whether tablets are sold with a cellular capability or not, only 5% actually have got a live cellular connection within them. So in actual fact, that 95% that are left need something to connect to, and Wi-Fi hotspots are the thing. So, I think that we're going to spend some time today talking about this, uh, privacy. And I think that this is a topic of this year. Uh, privacy is something that keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. And I think that the industry, IoT, M2M, connected car, uh, definitely needs to recognize it. Customers' access to data when we take it out of its source location, so if it's a car, or if it's an actual meter, 
So the customer must get access to that data, and we need a set of rules around that. We need to be able to have clarity around the usage of that data. Um, when we exchange that data with third parties for the provision of services, so in the Jaguar Land Rover connected car ecosystem, we've got a large number of partners providing breakdown assistance, stolen vehicle tracking, emergency services. When we exchange customers' data for the provision of these services, um, we need to be explicit with our customers that we're doing so and that we're doing it for the benefit of providing those services. The customers need to opt in to providing that, da that data to these, uh, to these parties in order to provision these services. The customer must always have the power to delete. At any moment, the customer decides, I don't like this, there must be a big button that says delete, I'm out of here. So there should be no fear from the customer's point of view that that big red button is hidden somewhere deep down in a menu. If there's any value exchange, it should be clear as well. In other words, if I'm using that data to garner some information around the customer in order to provide a better level of service, we often hear this in the software world, please share me the information about the product quality and crashes and bug reports so that I might improve my product. If that's the case, then you have to be explicit about the value exchange that's going on with the customer. Or if you're using Google Maps, the value exchange is that you're sharing your location and your speed in order to provide information as a probe in a network of roads regarding what's stalled traffic and what's not stalled. Be explicit about the safety precautions you're taking around data and take them and design them in from the beginning. And do all of this before the, gov the different governmental legislation comes in place, because it's coming. So design it for trust, because for many of us who work in a vertical space, our brands are very precious. And actually, the trust is very much associated with the brand. So these were very much the, the, um, the customer-focused products. But it's very fast that you fall into this whole B2B space and B2B to C space. And here you can see just the tip of the iceberg, insurance, CRM, remote assistance, fleet, weather, many of them. Too many for me to go into today, but I thought I would talk about some of them. Before falling into them, actually, a little bit the journey around how um, how we arrive into this B2B space is we almost believe that the vehicle is a rather formidable IoT node. And we come to this conclusion on the basis that uh, a vehicle, and certainly Jaguar Land Rover vehicles, come with between one to 200 ECUs or electronic control units that are either fairly basic microprocessors all the way up to full-scale computing units. And they're interconnected with cabling, harnessing, which measures about seven kilometers in length. It's crazy that we can actually fit such a quantity into such a compact space, and weighs roughly my weight. And the number of sensors that these ECUs connect to run into their hundreds. Many of these sensors are not really of value. We can't really extract anything from them. So the core block temperature of an engine or of a particular cylinder within an engine is not really something that we can harness. But it turns out, as you can see on the right here, that there are a lot of sensors that we can really harness. So we've got cameras We've got tens of cameras in our vehicles, cameras that work both in the visual spectrum and in the infrared spectrum. We've got radar, multiple radars, growing radars with the advent of ADAS. We have multiple components in the vehicle and actually the vehicle itself for which there is position, orientation, instantaneous velocity, 
and the acceleration, which relates to the car as a whole, to each of the individual suspension systems, several other moving components, and to the wheels themselves. And we can tell different things with each one of these pieces of information. So for a suspension system, for example, we can identify potholes. And what's more interesting from a safety perspective is to be able to identify significant potholes on motorways because they are a safety hazard as opposed to an inconvenience and a cost hazard. Multiple things in a vehicle are regarding fluid and pressure and wear levels, and we can also tell environmental information. So we can actually tell when it's raining. So if you imagine our recent investment in the UK in a stonking great big uh, computer in order to do predictive analysis on the weather, we have a network of cars in, in the UK constantly out there running. If they were all connected, we could tell precipitation to a very high level of accuracy down to, you know, almost to the meter level. And we also can tell temperature. So, the vehicle, a little bit like a phone of about 1998. A few years ago, you'd buy a vehicle. With the vehicle that you bought, it's the same experience the day you bought it as the day that you wanted to get rid of it. It's n it has not in the past been an evolving experience. And for a brand like Jaguar Land Rover, that's not acceptable. So creating an evolving and engaging experience is extremely important. So first is to create a, a direct customer d connection. So we have and we do create direct customer connections. So we start a dialogue with our customer. Insights, because of all of the data that the vehicle has that we've just spoken about, and because of the information that we have about our customers, we gain a significant amount of insight about our customer, our customer's vehicles, and our customer's usage of the vehicles. And we have also got a significant number of channels open uh, with our customers. So I showed you an app. The stickiness of that app is so significant that we see currently, I can't for privacy reasons talk about what's actually out there in our customer world, but in terms of our internal fleet world, I can tell that we're looking at a general level of usage of between three and a half to four times apps used per day in our internal fleet at the moment. So as a property to be visited, this is a high frequency property that's being visited, so that's an app. Then you've got direct messaging, emails and SMSs. Then you've got call outs from dealerships. So we've got multiple channels to talk to a customer. What we then do with that by blending all that to, together, so the different ways as a vertical that we take all that IoT data with the customer contact and the channels, proactive health alerts. We can tell a customer when their battery health has gone low. So we can create a, a battery protect product. Because for example, if a customer goes and buys an F-Type and a sports car is often a second or a third vehicle is very often used maybe 20, 30, or 40 days in a year. So it's often left unattended for long periods of time, not touched often during the winter months, which is a poor thing to do to a battery. We can actually tell that, and we can actually call out to a customer to proactively deal with the poor situation of a, of a battery going below a recoverable level to a point where it becomes irrecoverable and it becomes very expensive. We can then offer very much advanced service programs so that we call out directly to customers. We tell them, actually, you are a road warrior. Your burn rate in terms of miles because you're up and down the M40 and up and down the M4 is so high that you're going to be due for a service very soon. So we're going to call you in for a service at an appropriate time. 
rather than you have a, a private vehicle and your general mileage burn rate is so low that we don't need to call you in so soon. With advanced roadside assistance, uh, as an IoT node, um, there's a considerable uh, number of uh, diagnostics information that we can pull from the vehicle. Technically, they're called DTCs, diagnostic uh, technical codes and, and DIDs. And with those, um, if you were to break down at the side of the road, we can actually, without sending or prior to sending an engineer, we can inspect to a very great level of detail what is actually wrong with the vehicle. So before sending anybody to the vehicle, we can already diagnose the problem to choose what to do. So that can mean the vehicle can be put immediately into a limp mode so that there is no direct response needed in terms of sending a recovery vehicle and the customer can bring the vehicle to the garage the next day. So in a limp mode, you're limited to a certain maximum speed. Or it could determine the type of recovery vehicle and technician that we send because we know that there's a particular part that's needed and that particular part is in, uh, in response vehicle AB, which may not be the nearest response vehicle because response vehicle CD might be the re nearest response vehicle, but we'll swap their jobs because of the actual parts levels that are on their vehicles. And in the worst case, if the fault is so significant and the vehicle needs to be towed, we can already start the process of getting the courtesy vehicle ready. And finally, we can also tell information about when, uh, what the customer has been doing with their vehicle and we can pull together at the customer's request and their opt-in offers so that as the customer is entering their transition into a new vehicle, we can offer them uh, good offers. We can then connect Ford and people might have seen Alibaba in the news recently. They have Singles Day in China. They transacted the greatest single day of revenue, uh, several billions in one day, half of which was over mobile. Alibaba can actually tell in China when somebody will buy a car. And one of the greatest things that they can say is that nine months after a child arrives, because Alibaba knows when people buy formula milk and when, when they buy diapers, they can say that nine months later, they buy one of these. And when they buy one of these, it turns out that they really often buy one of these. <laughs> so not only <coughs> do we have this kind of customer relationship ongoing, but as we partner, we are able to partner smartly in different markets. And this is obviously a very China-specific case. And we can have this kind of fortuitous cases. So this is very much uh, uh, a Jaguar Land Rover case. Switching completely tracks. Um, Usage-based insurance. This is a very, very interesting one. Usage-based insurance turns out not to be one vertical. It's actually multiple verticals. It's about setting up panels and products. There's actually a whole industry about setting up insurance panels and products, all on its own, for which data is needed, data which needs to come from vehicles. Part of the industry is focused on the generation uh, or on the validation of new policies. So when a policy is actually created, it's really important to validate that the policyholder is the correct policyholder and they live at their correct address. The enforcement of the insurance type, and there are two key different ones, there's pay as you drive, which is less invasive, it's more about general environmental factors, when do you drive, rather than how do you drive. Then there's how you drive, which is your braking and your acceleration and whether you surpass the limits of any particular roads. 
So there's the enforcement side. And then there's a whole other vertical as well, which is claim reporting and first notification of loss. So it turns out that actually the usage-based insurance industry <laughs> is not one vertical. It is all of these verticals. And they all need to talk to each other. But what they all share is this terrible situation that they need information from the vehicle. And putting black boxes in vehicles is an expensive business. You take a black box, a TCU, various different cost levels. The more cost you put in, the higher the quality. Some harnessing, some shipping, some installation. And don't forget the activation, which costs money because there's humans typically involved in a part of that process. And there's warranty and there's replacement. And if such hardware is being placed into their vehicles already, um, then wouldn't it be great if that information could flow out through some kind of data exchange? So, show me the money. I unfortunately can't show you the Jaguar Land Rover analysis, but there are analyses that are available. This one happens to be from uh, Secure by Design. And Secure by Design says that uh, on a yearly basis, there is a B2B opportunity of about 95 euros per car per year in this space. We may not agree with every particular number here. We believe some of them are too high, and certainly some of them are too low. But it seems that there is certainly real value in this space. My last slide. What this space is doing is in the automotive sector and its associated ecosystem is it's disrupting value chains. And it's causing disquiet. Six key trends which um, are affecting us today. One is that telematic pl telematics platforms, M2M platforms, IoT platforms in the connected car space, they're consolidating. And they're only consolidating on the basis that most of the automotive OEMs have effectively made their choices. The only places where they haven't really made their choices are OEMs as you move into Asia, and especially into China. They're the, let's say, the more unconquered territories. But the job of having the right kind of platform is not complete. Network operators, so mobile operators, have a real challenge. Today, getting a sensible coverage, especially if you are a global provider of service, it's very difficult. And so there is a distance yet to go to be able to deal with a small number of global providers to get a high level of mobile connectivity, quality of service. It's certainly a space where there is quite a lot of mergers and acquisitions and partnerships taking place. And there is a lot of work ongoing within the industry. You can see it where acquisitions and mergers are taking place on items that are considered to be core and partnerships on those elements that are considered to be the complementaries. There are verticals, I think insurance is definitely one of them, where there are such large verticals with such history and such legacy systems that it will be very interesting to see how insurance industry, big older companies, are able to migrate their old systems away to be able to adopt to completely new models. The app ecosystem apps are important. Uh, they will continue to be important, but one can't uh, but lose the fact that Apple and Google own the app ecosystem. And finally, um, autonomous driving. It is a hard problem to solve. It is not a problem about cars. It is a problem about cars and the network that they live in. And it would seem that that is a space that is up for grabs. So despite whoever is today active and busy in that environment, it is very much a space up for grabs. It's about people who make investments into that space. There is nobody with an ordained pre-approved right in that space. Thank you for your time.